Well, the stock market suffered its second straight down day today. Things were a lot worse in the morning, however. We did have a nice little rally towards the end of the day. We still finished about 0.4% lower on the S&P 500. The intermediate trend remains bullish, but we've been long overdue for some sort of a pullback in the short term. So perhaps this is kind of the beginning of that here today. A lot of today's selling was as a result of rumors that the United States and China were likely to not get the phase one portion of their trade deal done by this year. We also saw some of the Federal Reserve minutes that suggest they're happy with where the interest rate environment is right now, and they are unlikely to be cutting interest rates further anytime soon. So we'll take a look at all of that, see how it affects our posture. Uh, we'll then get into our trade application example today on an area that has had a nice bounce over the last week, but is now nearing a resistance point and might be worth set up for a bearish trade. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's November 20th, 2019. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go to YouTube, click subscribe. While you're over there, make sure you check out our description area where you can sign up for our email distribution list as well. We're also heavy users of Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. In fact, we had a lot of buzz on my Twitter feed here today regarding a particular stock that many of my students over time have owned. And uh, today was what we call double day, meaning that we doubled our money in that particular stock. So if you're curious about that, head on over to my Twitter feed. Again, it's at Brandon Van Z. Lastly, we have a presence on Facebook, feel free to check out our group at the web address embedded in the logo in front of you. All right, with that, let's go ahead and jump into the charts. As you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us. This will give us a nice overview for the four major U.S. equity indices here. We've got the S&P 500 in the upper left, Dow Jones Industrial Average upper right, NASDAQ Composite lower left, and Russell 2000 lower right. As you can see, the background colors of all these charts remain green despite today's selling. Uh, as mentioned in the intro, this was actually our second straight day of selling after touching an intraday all-time high just yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, a little bit of selling there, nothing to get uh, too uh, worried about or, or up in arms about. Uh, as you can see, we have a long lower shadow on that particular candle today on the S&P 500, telling us that the bulls uh, were able to uh, kind of try to, uh, you know, keep things modest by the end of the day in terms of the selling that was occurring. So uh, we'll see where it leads us. Uh, but at this point, uh, our posture stays the same from an intermediate term perspective. Now, from a near-term perspective, the blue line did fall out of that upper reversal zone. From, so from a swing trading perspective, uh, your posture might be a little bit more bearish there as we've seen a little bit more selling here recently. But like I mentioned in the intro, we were only down, in this case, 0.38%. Uh, not a big deal. Uh, remember, it's been quite some time since we've even had a 1% down day. We'd probably have to go all the way back to this candle back here at the beginning of October. So uh, as it stands, pretty much status quo there despite the selling that we saw here in the last couple of days. And it's largely the same story uh, with the other indices there as well. Uh, one thing that I would point out is that on the Russell 2000, it was down 0.42% today. It has not hit a new high in recent sessions uh, the way that the other three indices have. The other thing I'd point out is that the market sentiment line on the Russell 2000 is now falling. So note there in the orange label of these charts, it'll actually tell you whether uh, the, the sentiment line or any other line of, of these that we track uh, is falling or rising. And as long as the current reading is somewhere between 20 and 80, if that metric is falling like it is right now, it's at 61 and falling, uh, that would uh, be considered bearish. Uh, from a market sentiment perspective, which is the longest look back period of all of these lines that we cover here uh, within this market forecast and market sentiment indicators. Uh, that is the only one that's doing that right now. You can see that it's still rising here with the Dow Jones and here with the S&P 500 and here with the NASDAQ composite. So it's just one more piece of information to be aware of, nothing to you know, obviously make any massive short term trade upon or anything along those lines, just trying to give us a, a feel for where do things sit here currently. So for the most part, uh, while we had some selling here today, it was not aggressive selling. 
the, the Bulls did show up near the end of the day to kind of save the day a little bit, but don't be surprised if we have a little bit more uh, selling in store in the coming week or two. However, that should not change our overall posture going into the year end where we still expect bullishness going forward and new all-time highs uh, as we go forward as well. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our next chart setup. In this case, we're going to go ahead and take a peek at our three green arrows here, see if anything changed from when I did the video yesterday. Uh, it does look like we had some change. In fact, uh, two, two of the four charts gave us some change to discuss, and that is uh, the two on top. So I mentioned yesterday that uh, the S&P 500 and, and Dow Jones Industrial Average were still managing to retain their three green arrows signal. As of today, that's no longer the case. You can see we received a red arrow today on the MACD histogram on both the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So you can see with the color background here, it, it was green yesterday. Day, but as of right now, it just reverted back to white, meaning we've got a mix of green and red arrows. Remember, if it's ever a pink background uh, like it was back here, that means we actually have a three red arrow signal. So right now, when we have a white background, we basically have more of a mix. We're still kind of in no man's land trying to figure out direction right here. You know, obviously, the 30-day moving average is tilted higher in all four of these charts cases. So our expectations are our further upside price action when that sideways action gets resolved. But obviously, if that changes, we'll be the first to let you know about that here in the Market Outlook video. All right, moving right along to our longer term view. This is the 1040 crossover method here. And main thing that you're going to be, want to be aware of is that the Russell 2000 uh, does have a bullish crossover that did occur here about three or four weeks ago. That was the most recent thing uh, that has occurred or change that has occurred here. Otherwise, status quo, uh, we're just con continuing to hit new highs on, on markets. And that's a good thing for those of you that have kind of followed the teachings of the 1040 crossover method, because in all three of those charts there, you would have gotten into the market back here in February or March of this year and you'd still be in the market right now. Uh, obviously, that's a less sensitive approach. So if you're somebody that likes to be an active trader, probably not going to work so well for you. But for those of you that have 401k money and different things like that on the sideline that you can't really trade all that often, uh, then perhaps something like a 1040 crossover method uh, would be something to consider there. All right, moving right along now, let's go ahead and take a peek here at the uh, chart 5A, the asset class 12 grid. And as you can see here, uh, we still have those bullish postures up at the top. In fact, we do have a change to report up on the top rung here as well today. Remember yesterday when I went through this, uh, the EEM or the, the emerging markets from a foreign stocks perspective actually had a bearish posture. So today we had uh, a change of, of, of posture right there as that intermediate line started to rise here again. So anyway, that one appears to be kind of going waffling back and forth, whereas we've got a little bit more steadfast action here uh, with the, the US market and also the foreign developed markets. But good to see there if you are bullish, you probably want the emerging markets to kind of you know pull their weight a little bit. And, appears that that is uh, the case here. Uh, TNX fell yet again today. I was, I've was i been curious about this one, wondering if we're going to start seeing a little bit of a, uh, a bounce back uh, of sorts, but uh, so far we haven't received it. Uh, we've seen now, let's count them out, one, two, three, four, four, five, six out of the last seven days uh, have been downside action in yields and therefore upside action in bonds. And so uh, pretty interesting uh, from that perspective. This might have been influenced by what I mentioned in the intro here today that the Federal Reserve is pretty happy with where interest rates are here and uh, does not anticipate cutting rates again uh, here in the coming month or two. And so uh, perhaps that's the market's response to uh, learning that information a bit more there. As you can see, uh, we do have uh, strength here in oil today. That's worth uh, pointing out. We were up 2.8% uh, here on USO uh, as some of those uh, inventories were reduced. And that actually had a positive impact on uh, some of the individual oil stocks out there. In fact, that was a topic that we had uh, discussed here today in my uh, factor-based swing trading class. We were actually planning on uh, looking at a uh, oil stock trade setup 
uh, but the stock had moved so much in just one hour's time while I was giving my normal class that we had to kind of pivot uh, in the in the middle of the class and kind of uh, redirection our thoughts into uh, another area. Uh, we do have a uh, oil stock to the long side right now in that class. So we didn't mind necessarily uh, pivoting in this particular case, but uh, there were some big movers within the oil space today. If you look at the energy stock movers, um, you're going to find some some pretty big outliers there to the upside. So uh, we'll keep our eye on that. But right now, oil does have a strongly bullish intermediate posture, and it had a really nice bounce off of that rising moving average right there, and that has. Uh, allowed some of those oil and gas stocks to, to perk up pretty nicely here today. All right, let's go ahead and now take a look at another chart setup. Uh, we did sectors yesterday, so let's go ahead and advance our thoughts here today on over here to 5E. This is the global stocks primary grid. And as you can see, we've got three pink charts on the board. This is uh, chart 5E for those of you that are premium members following along at home. So we've got China, we've got Brazil, and we've got Russia part of the BRICS, uh, you know, along with, with India. So uh, B is for Brazil, R is for Russia, I is for India, and then C is for China. Sometimes folks will throw an extra I in there for Indonesia as well. But uh, anyway, if you've ever heard that term BRIC, that's what they're referring to, really the, the major emerging markets that are taking place out there. Now remember, they might be emerging, but they can still be very large economies. And so of course, China is still considered an emerging market, but it's actually the second largest economy on the planet. Uh, they have a, a massive population there and probably some interesting runway for growth uh, as well as long as you're looking at a, a longer period of time. But right now we've had a little bit of a pullback in China and you can see we're currently trading below the moving average and it does have that pink background telling us that we have a bearish posture with FXI right now. Now remember FXI uh, is a little bit of a blend between China and Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of those securities that trade over in Hong Kong, they're your big bigger kind of blue chip Chinese companies. This is not necessarily your mainland domestic Chinese companies all in. So uh, be aware of that. There's a number of different ETFs that you can look at that kind of look at China from a different angle. But this is the one that has probably the most liquidity that most people kind of use as their proxy for China, which is FXI. Uh, Brazil is down below here. That's EWZ. It also has that uh, dark pink background there telling us we've got a bearish posture. Uh, but you know this one's kind of at an interesting junction. We've been down three days in a row in Brazil, but we're kind of getting back into this range where we were trading over here in October. So you never know, maybe it's time for a little bit of a bounce here, but uh, I would say it's not necessarily a, a great healthy sign that when we bounced over here about a week ago, we went up a couple of days in a row. We went up to that moving average, we rejected it, and we went right back down lower and actually uh, breached this prior candle right there. So that's not a great sign of what we're seeing in Brazil right now. So they got a little bit of work to do uh, to start carving out uh, more of a bottom there before we get too excited about it. And then Russia is a little bit of a different story than those other two. You can see the background color on Russia is light pink instead of dark pink. Uh, and that tells us that we do have a bearish posture, but it would be considered a weekly bearish posture. You can see that the intermediate line is at 75 and falling. So remember, if it's below 80 and falling, it's considered bearish. If the number is between 80 and 50, in this case 75 would fit that, uh, then we would consider that weekly bearish. So remember, if this were to pop from 75 back up to 80, we would immediately put that into strong bullish category again. So you know, it's kind of one of those where it's giving us some wear and tear signs that we want to be aware of, but uh, we don't want to completely dismiss it because it could easily pop back into bullish camp here uh, relatively quick. Now, one of the, the bullish charts that catches my eye as we're looking at this is India. Um, India had a really nice bounce today. Some of you might be looking to play that to the long side from a swing trading perspective there. Uh, India did fall to its uh, rising moving average, stabilized around that, kind of rode that moving average higher for uh, several days in the last week. And today had a little bit more oomph off that moving average, almost looking like it's going to use that as kind of a launch pad there. So India had a very nice day. EPI was up 0.74%. It continues to have a strongly bullish posture and a really nice bounce set up there off of that rising moving average. Let's take a look at the secondary uh, markets now. And this will be chart 5G here. All right, so as we pull this up, uh, we've only got one pink chart on the board. That's actually Mexico here. 
And it looks like Mexico is kind of in a little bit of a, a, a failure move right here. Now, they've had a good run over the last three months. So we can't you know, discount that too much because they, they're up 13%. That's a good, strong, healthy move in Mexico there. Uh, but this most recent bounce right here uh, did leave quite a bit to be desired because you can see that it bounced above the moving average and then immediately failed pretty much the next day. And now we find ourselves back below that moving average with the intermediate line at 60 and falling. We would consider that weakly bearish at this point. The other charts uh, are maybe holding up a bit better, at least from a uh, market forecast posture perspective, as they all have uh, green, either dark or uh, light green, telling us that there is some evidence of um, some bullishness there. Uh, one that I, I did want to point out just because it's a big mover today and it's one that we've been kind of talking about, not necessarily for good reasons in the past, but um, you know, who knows? Maybe this thing can get started a little bit here. This is Argentina down in the bottom rung. You can see this is an awfully peculiar looking chart because Argentina was the country that had that massive meltdown in one day based off of some election information and uh, has since then just been trying to find a bottom. Whereas most of these charts that you see here have kind of an upward tilt towards them, this one right here is effectively just going sideways. Uh, it has not been able to kind of kick it into high gear there. But today was a very nice day for Argentina. You can see ARGT was up 2.59%. Remember, if you, if you see a growth stock or something like that up that much, it's not that big of a deal. But we're talking about an entire country here, up 2.59%. So that's a pretty healthy amount, uh, even for um, kind of a lesser uh, substantial uh, economy like Argentina compared to many other uh, economies that are a bit much more uh, robust out there anyway. Uh, so keep your eye on it. Um, not to say that this is the type of thing that you jump in on because it, it would certainly be speculative considering what we've seen out of this chart in the last three months. But at some point, if we start making a more concerted uh, break towards the upside, because we've dropped so far in the last year on Argentina, that could be an interesting value opportunity there, uh, whereas there's not as many value opportunities uh, elsewhere across the globe because many of those markets have already made their moves. All right, let's go ahead and now take a quick little conversation about uh, commodities here. And let's talk about chart 5K. This is the commodities 12 grid. All right, so as we're looking at this particular chart here, um, or this 12 grid of, of charts, uh, you can see that it's kind of a mixed bag depending upon where you're at. We talked about oil already when we were talking about the intermarket analysis, nice little healthy bounce there in oil. But we also got a very healthy bounce out of gasoline. Some of you might recall that we were talking about gasoline here in this presentation maybe a week or two ago and recognizing that it's in a pretty healthy uh, little uptrend there. And uh, today was a nice supportive price action there for gasoline as well as it bounced off of that rising 30-day moving average. Now, as a, as a consumer of gasoline, you might not be all that enthusiastic about that if you're gearing up the old family truckster for your upcoming Thanksgiving uh, drive. But uh, for investors and traders out there, perhaps there's opportunities. And UGA still looks like it's entrenched in a pretty steady uptrend right there. A lot of the other areas are um, less ideal. I would say that copper is a, a kind of a nice little move here uh, recently. It does have a bearish posture still, so we wouldn't you know, go hog wild with any major bullish type of a trade. But the reason I point it out is that copper is generally viewed as kind of a, a barometer of sorts of the economy. And so if you, want a if you want to see a strong economy, which is what a lot of investors and traders want, then you'd likely want to see copper uh, doing better, not worse. And so with copper being up here in the upper half of the range, perhaps that's a, a strong sign for the overall uh, economy. Real quick over here on the internet, I did want to say thank you to those of you that went out of your way to click like for me here yesterday. In fact, it was another one of those, I think I called it the Jerry Seinfeld moment uh, a couple of uh, sessions ago when I did the, the presentation because we landed exactly on 100. I don't know why that, that hits the back of my mind. There was some commercial several years ago where Seinfeld was on the commercial and he's pumping gas and he gets it right on like $50 even and he got really excited about it. So when I get right on 100 likes, I get really excited about it. Thank you in all seriousness. That really helps us along. Uh, again, this 
takes a lot of time. I know it probably doesn't seem like it to you. You're the, you get the benefit of just listening to these presentations. Uh, it does take David and I two or three hours all in uh, to produce these, and we don't make money directly from these videos, and so we kind of have to have you know uh, one of those scenarios where uh, we've got to you know prove justification uh, to do the videos and so uh, one of the ways that we can currently justify it in our head is that if we do the videos and you guys are clicking like on Twitter a it tells us you're getting value out of it but B it also helps our business because it presents market scholars business to a much wider audience than we would be able to on our own so it is in your best interest if you enjoy these videos to click like for David and I on Twitter because if you don't and everybody kind of you know does that same type of thing in other words stop t uh, clicking like there's a there's a good chance that at some point down the road D Dave and I will just have to you know make the hard decision to just shut it down and, and concentrate our efforts on our premium side of our business and I know many of you probably would not like that so uh, do your best uh, to, to click like for us each and every day if you can and you can do that directly here on our website by clicking this little graphic down below here uh, or you could just go directly over to Twitter uh, and, and look at my timeline over there where I pin uh, this presentation to the top of my Twitter timeline. We also include the link uh, for the tweet in our email that we send to all of you on our notifications list, and we also post the link directly to that tweet within the description area of the YouTube video for those of you that go and watch our videos directly on YouTube. So there's four different easy ways that we make it uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, simple for you guys to go out and, and support us there on Twitter. Thank you very much to those of you that do that. Also, uh, we had a great session here today, as I mentioned before, in the swing trading class. We actually shorted a stock in our swing trading class from the consumer staples space. So if you're interested in that and you are a premium member of Market Scholars, feel free to come up here to our trading rooms and then click on uh, the, the calendar there to access uh, the recording from today. David taught his options inventory management class earlier today as well. And then tomorrow, what we've got on the docket is my Q&A session for premium members uh, there uh, first thing in the morning, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And then we've also got uh, David's portfolio management with ETFs class. Uh, and so make sure you're taking advantage of that. Remember, next Thursday will be Thanksgiving, and so uh, we won't be having those Thursday classes a week from tomorrow. So if you if you need your fix of portfolio management with ETFs, make sure you stop on by David's class tomorrow afternoon. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get back on over here to the Thinkorswim platform, and let's discuss our trade application example for the day. And so I wanted to come on over here to chart 3A. And I wanted to pull up ticker symbol VNQ. Some of you will recognize that ticker symbol. It is oftentimes used as a proxy for REITs or real estate investment trusts. And one of the things that I've been kind of identifying here recently is that REITs and utilities have really fallen out of bed here in the last maybe month or so at least in comparison to the rest of the market, right? You're not seeing spiraling stocks or anything like that, but compared to the rest of the market, which is largely marching to new highs, um, seeing a couple of key areas of the market marching the opposite direction down uh, does stand out. And that's certainly what's happened. In fact, that's been a, a big discussion of, of ours in my factor-based swing trading class as well, uh, because one of our factors that we concentrate on is low volatility factor. And that particular factor uh, has been the lagging factor here uh, in recent weeks as well. So Anyway, um, utilities and REITs have fallen out of favor. Now, a lot of that is as a result of their interest rate sensitivity. When interest rates go down, REITs and utilities tend to go up in price, and the vice versa is also true. When interest rates go up, REITs and utilities tend to go down in price, or at least underperform on a relative basis. So where we find ourselves right now with VNQ is you can see that it was largely an inline market performer all the way up until about right here. That's when you started to see this separation. Notice that we've got this S&P 500 dotted line on this chart. This is chart 3A for those of you following along at home. So we plotted against the S&P 500 to get a sense of is there relative strength or relative weakness on the underlying security? Well, in this case, you can see we clearly have um, relative weakness here compared to the S&P 500 uh, in, in terms of looking at VNQ, the Vanguard Real Estate ETF. 
Now, after we fell out of bed here, you can see we sliced through that moving average. We continue to travel lower, eventually getting to a point where we produce this oversold cluster signal right here. So you see this little green dot down below here in the indicator itself. You see this green dot on the chart with the corresponding candle there to make it easier for your eye. And again, that's all available for those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars. Remember, we have 50 different charts that uh, we, we, we send your way to uh, let you uh, take full advantage of our resources here. So uh, if it makes it easier for your eye there to identify those clusters and that has helped you become a better trader, uh, then you'll be able to get access to that as a premium member of Market Scholars. But anyway, you can see that we got those that oversold cluster signal uh, right there on the 12th of November. Since that time period, and by the way, those clusters oftentimes mean that the, the, the movement that took you into that cluster signal has been too far too fast. In this case, the movement I'm referring to is a movement down because remember, there are cluster signals on the upside as well. This is a cluster signal on the downside, so that downward movement was too far too fast. A lot of times we get a reflex type of a move after that type of an extreme push in, in one direction. So we have since realized that reflex move. You can see that we had five straight up days for VNQ that ended here today for the first time. We, were, we weren't down much, but we were down today. We were down 0.05% there. And you can see that where it stands right now from a swing trading perspective, remember on the swing trading perspective, we use this blue line or the near term line on the market forecast. So you can see that as of today, we now have a bearish near term posture on VNQ. Now again, I'm stressing that because um, in this video, unless you hear us tell you otherwise, the default mode of looking at the market forecast is using the green line. The green line is still bullish. So from a trending perspective, there is still some you know, evidence of bullishness there. But from a shorter term swing trading perspective, we now have a bearish posture for the first time since going all the way back here about a week and a half ago. And now that we've kind of advanced with this reflex move up to this moving average, it has me wondering if this moving average itself will start acting as resistance. After all, this stock or this ETF touched the moving average right there, it touched the moving average right there, and it touched the moving average right there. So for three straight days, we've been kind of stuck on the moving average. It hasn't been able to kind of, you know, get out of the mud, so to speak. You know, we had some great traction here for the bullish side of the argument, but we kind of ran out of that traction. And now our wheels are just spinning in the mud the last uh, few sessions. So it has you wondering, you know, is this kind of a uh, transition type of a candle where we start seeing, you know, that prior trend that we saw develop from uh, October 22nd down here to uh, November 12th, if that gets back into play here. And, and so the way I'd be looking at this is more bearish at this point. Uh, it's exhausted quite a bit of energy going up as rapidly as it has here on this reflex move. And so one of the things that you know you start looking for are, are, are kind of landmarks on the chart. And one of the key landmarks on this chart is where did it top out when things were really hot before the world knew that REITs and utilities were gonna start rolling over? Well, when this thing was as hot as, as it could get, it was 95.49 on the chart. That was the high price right there. So that's kind of our landmark in this conversation. Now there's a number of ways you could play it in this particular case, I'm going to do what's known as a bear call spread. And so that would be selling a call at one strike and buying another call in the same month uh, at a higher strike in creating a vertical spread that allows for a credit to be produced up front. And as long as the stock doesn't skyrocket higher, you stand a good chance to keep that credit when those options expire uh, down the road. So for that, I've got this pulled up already down below here. Um, you can see that I'm using the $95 call in January. So these are the January monthly contracts on VNQ uh, that expire in 58 days. So I'm using the 95 as my sold strike. I'm using the 96 as my bought strike. Now remember, some of you might not like 
uh, the $1 wides or what have you. There used to be a, an argument that was a little bit more emphatic there with $1 wides on higher price securities like this because it used to cost something to trade, uh, trade stocks. Uh, I, I say that half tongue in cheek because of course some brokers still charge you uh, and even the ones that went to zero commission still charge a little bit for, for options trading. But it is also true that those of you that used to never trade $1 wide strikes because you were afraid of how much commission you'd get charged, um, that argument isn't quite as solid today as it once was. And so uh, what we look for instead is to make sure that we have a healthy return on risk. In order to calculate return on risk, you can see I'm getting a 25 cent credit on a $1 wide uh, uh, strike or vertical spread here. If I click on the c confirm and send button, I can then get my calculator out, and I'm just doing one contract here just for example purposes on paper money, but obviously you would adjust as uh, needed for your own account size. In this case, we would simply take the profit of $25, divide it by the max loss of 75, and you can see that our return on risk would be 33.3%. So again, we usually try to shoot for 30% or above. This would qualify for that. So uh, you can also see while I'm here that the break-even price on this trade would be 95.25. And so as we come back on over here to the chart, 95.25 would be right back where that landmark was. Again, the highest price this thing ever printed was 95.49. Our break even would be 95.25. In other words, if you feel like this landmark will hold through um, January expiration cycle, then this could be a trade that could produce some uh, profits there for you. And remember, it is a higher probability trade because it does make money off of time decay. So even if the stock ends up going just completely sideways and it doesn't go back lower, you would still make money off of this bear call spread. The main thing you're hoping not to occur is for a rapid rally higher from these levels. So you do have to have a slight bearish tilt here, but it doesn't have to be dramatic in nature because a sideways traveling stock can be just as effective in this particular case. So we'll go ahead and place that trade by clicking confirm and send and sending that off. All right, well, thank you for joining me here yet again. Had a couple of days of pullback now, but nothing too violent in the market. So we're kind of just waiting patiently. It's been uh, a long run. We still have that near-term line on the S&P 500 above 50, by the way. So we're on our like 30th day of this bullish near-term run. But at least now we can say we have a near-term bearish posture. We still have a bullish posture from an intermediate perspective. So the trend is still intact there, uh, but we're just kind of waiting for maybe a little bit of a pullback here in the next week or two uh, before kicking it into high gear going into the holidays. So uh, we practice with a bearish trade in our application example today. If you got value out of hearing this analysis today, please go over to Twitter, click like there for me. Certainly appreciate that. And then David should be back in the saddle there for you tomorrow. So with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.